My boyfriend and I decided to go on a road trip to my dad's hunting cabin in northern West Virginia, just a few counties over from Point Pleasant. We packed all our gear into the truck the night before so we could get an early start the next morning. We got up early because we couldn't contain our excitement. Our trip to the cabin went fine. We reached the town that the cabin was near and loaded up on groceries. About an hour later, we were turning down a dirt road towards the cabin. The cabin was about 50 miles back in the boondocks, away from any kind of civilization. It's a very isolated and creepy place at times. We drove down the dirt road for what seemed like forever, then we finally saw the cabin. Both of us were tired from the trip and planned on relaxing by the fireplace and watching some DVDs as soon as the bags and groceries were unpacked. We got everything inside and started dinner while my boyfriend, let's call him Neil, planned on getting some firewood from the back. By seven, the sun was setting and we made sure all the doors and windows were locked. It's a small one bedroom cabin and there were maybe five windows and two doors. This will be important later. After we cleaned up, we decided to watch Catch Me If You Can on DVD, so nothing scary. I reached for a cigarette, only to find my pack was empty. I asked Neil where the carton was, and he told me it was in the truck. He then asked if I wanted him to get them. I told him no, then I slipped on my shoes, and made my way to the door. I've always been scared of the dark, so I've hated going outside in the dark for as long as I can remember. I turned back to Neil and asked him if he would stand at the front door while I went to the truck. He said yes and made his way over. I eased outside and down the steps to the truck. I was reaching in to get the carton of cigarettes when I heard this sound. At first it sounded like a woman screaming, then it changed to howling. Then it was like those sounds came together to form one creaky sound. Honestly, it's hard to explain. It sounded like a demon and a werewolf all in one. I made a beeline for the cabin and I saw Neil's face fully drained of color. I pushed him inside and asked him what that was. It took him a while to answer, but he told me he didn't know. I've been in the woods hunting and fishing with my dad and brothers all my life and I had never heard any animal sound like that before, I told him. Then we heard it again, only it was near the living room window this time. Neil made a mad dash to the bedroom to grab his pistol. I got my dad's hunting rifle from the closet. I had never been so scared in all my life. I thought, what if this thing tries to come in here? Then we heard it again at the front door. I took aim at the door. My tiny hands were shaking. I may be a five foot four female but I was going to unleash hell on this thing if it tried to set foot inside. Then I screamed again, only it wasn't at the door anymore, it was at the kitchen window. Neil and I stood back, with our guns at the ready. Then we heard a crunching sound, like metal was being destroyed, we were too scared to move. Finally, after an hour of standing like that, we were not hearing anything else. We eased over to the kitchen window to look if we could see anything. Neil being taller than me looked first and he said, Oh my god, it ripped a hole in my truck. I looked out the window and saw a huge hole ripped in the door. We then double checked every window and door to make sure they were locked. We stayed up all night listening, scared something would come back. Morning came and we decided to inspect the truck. Neil went out first with his pistol by his side. I had the hunting rifle. We got to the truck, and there were claw marks from the tail light to the passenger door, then a huge hole punched into it. We got back inside and called the forest ranger. He came out about three hours later, looked at our truck, and told us that in the last six months, 12 people have gone missing from that area, and farms that are close by have reported the same sounds that we heard during the night. The next morning, the farmers would find their animals either gone or gutted. He told us it would be wise to clear out until they could find the animal responsible for all this. He looked scared and pale himself. He said he didn't want to be up here for long periods of time, 
but he would wait for us to pack our things and follow us to the main road. We didn't need to be told twice. We tossed our stuff into the truck and flew down that dirt road. When we made it to the main road, we thanked him and went on our way. To my knowledge, they have never found any animal, thing, or person that could do something like this in those woods. We have never been back there since. We didn't see whatever it was, and I'm glad we didn't, but I do know that no animal could make those sounds and could do that kind of damage to a truck, not even a bear. My friend Quinn and I went on a hike a few years ago, and something really creepy happened. We had decided on a spot just a couple of hours away from our small town. It was not an official trail, but we had a good map, and we knew the general area pretty well. When we arrived, the air was crisp and filled with the scent of pine and a little bit of smoke, typical in our area. I parked the car, and we shouldered our backpacks, ensuring we had enough supplies for the journey ahead. With sturdy boots laced tightly, we set off. It was just past 10 a.m. The trail meandered through some dense forest. The sunlight filtered through the trees and the leaves above. The trail was sparsely marked, with white paint on a tree every one or two hundred feet. We lost and found the trail a few times over the first few hours. It seemed like a matter of time before we lost it for good. We weren't worried though. I had my GPS in case anything happened. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, the terrain began to change. The trail became less defined, and we relied on our map and our instincts to guide us forward. The beauty of the surroundings made it all worth it. Another hour of hiking, and we were pretty sure we were lost. We hadn't seen a marker in a long time. I was concerned that we had wandered onto private land. You can get in trouble for that where I live. Just then, we saw a small cabin off in the distance. The structure stood weathered and worn, as if it hadn't been maintained in a long time. We were curious, so even though we knew we shouldn't, Quinn and I cautiously approached the cabin. As we got closer, it looked even worse than we thought. The wooden planks groaned under our weight as we stepped up to the front door. We walked through the open door, our eyes adjusting to the dim light filtering through the broken windows. The air was musty, and there was a terrible smell. As we explored the cabin's interior, we discovered remnants of its past occupants. Jars of an unknown yellow liquid stood on dusty shelves. Probably urine, but I'm not really sure what the point of that would be. There was a pile of old magazines on the table, their pages yellowed and torn. Among the faded images, we noticed a disturbing pattern. The eyes of all the people on the pages had been ripped out. It was like something out of a scary movie. Quinn thought it was staged to look creepy, like some kids had set it up to be a creepy place for hikers to find, but I thought it was real. A pungent odor filled the air. It smelled like rotting meat. We searched for the source of the smell, but we couldn't find it. After less than 10 minutes, we made our way out of the cabin. It was still early, but we decided to head back anyway. We didn't plan for an overnight, so we had to be careful with our time. Little did we know that our eerie encounter was not over yet. As we continued our journey back along the trail, we encountered a man. He seemed out of place, he didn't have any hiking gear, and he was walking in even though it was late afternoon. He greeted us with a forced smile and claimed to be out for a hike. We parted ways quickly and looked back every few steps to make sure he wasn't following us. He was walking in the direction of the cabin. We eventually made it back to our car, which was parked near the entrance of the trail. On our way out, we didn't see another car or truck parked up there, so we have no idea how that other guy got in. I think he was living in the cabin. Either way, he was a weird guy, and I'm glad we didn't find that place when he was around. I'm a 22-year-old guy, and this all happened when I was around 10. 
My parents took me and my brother Connor to a cabin in the mountains one summer. It belonged to our uncle, and he had owned it for a few years at that point. It was about a five hour drive from our home, so we set out after school on Thursday, eager for an adventure that awaited us. We drove up there in my dad's work truck, because the terrain was a little too much for the car. My dad worked for a construction company, so he could use the truck. When we got there, the sun was pretty much down. It would be dark in less than an hour. The cabin stood in a small clearing in the forest, its wooden exterior blending harmoniously with the surrounding nature. Inside, the cabin had a rustic charm. It had a single room that was divided up into a kitchen, living room, and a full-sized bed in the corner. That's where my parents would sleep. There was also a loft up top, where Connor and I would sleep. The loft had a small round window that offered a view of the winding driveway leading up to the cabin. After unpacking our belongings and settling in, it was time for bed. It had been a long day, and I could feel my eyelids growing heavy. Connor, who was two years younger than me, was soon asleep. However, I was not able to fall asleep so easily, even though I was tired. I've always had trouble sleeping away from home. I still do to this day. I was fully expecting to doze in and out of sleep for most of the night. My parents stayed up talking quietly, not wanting to keep us awake. The loft was open to the rest of the cabin. I couldn't hear what they were talking about, and I didn't care. Maybe if I listened closely, I'd be able to tell, but I didn't bother. At around midnight, a knock on the cabin door broke the relative silence. I heard my dad walk over to it, and my mom whispered something to him. Curiosity got the better of me, and I quietly peeked over the edge of the loft to catch a glimpse of the visitor. I watched my dad peek out the window at the front. He didn't open the door. Then another knock came, this one louder and more aggressive. After that, my dad opened the door a crack and slipped out, closing the door behind him. My mother stood there fidgeting with her fingers. It was clear that she was very nervous. I was terrified and curious, but too scared to come down. I crawled over to the window at the front and peeked out, hoping I could see something. There on the driveway in front of the cabin were two pickup trucks that were not ours. They had bright headlights on, and I could see that there were at least three men standing around them. At least one of them was holding a gun. When I saw that, I hid under my blanket and covered my ears. Through my hands, I could still hear the door open and then close one more time. I mustered the courage to peek over once more. I was relieved that it was just my dad coming back in. I could hear my parents whispering again, but I could only make out a few words. My dad said something like, We'll leave in the morning. By the time morning arrived, I had hardly slept. I was sensing that something was wrong, and my father gathered us around the breakfast table, his face marked with concern. He explained that we would be leaving the cabin right away, but he didn't tell us why. Connor complained, but I didn't argue. He had been asleep the whole time, so he didn't understand. I wanted to ask my dad what happened, but he was very strict, and when he said something, it was usually final. He told me not to ask, so I didn't. My parents remained tight-lipped, shielding us from the potentially unsettling truth. As we packed up our belongings and got ready to leave, I felt confused and scared. We left that place and never came back. Over the years, the memory of that night continued to haunt me. I often wondered who those men were and what they wanted from us. Over all those years, my father never told me anything about that night. I can understand why he kept it a secret when I was a kid, but I don't know why he won't tell me now. My mother's the same. One thing I can tell you though, is that my uncle who owned the cabin was caught smuggling drugs around the time of the incident. He did a few years in prison for it, and the cabin was repossessed as a result. My best guess is that he got on the wrong side with some dangerous guys, and they came to pay him a visit. If that's the case, then we were lucky that they let us leave. Not everyone would be so fortunate.
The sun was setting as Tammy and I were heading south through a small town in Montana. As we drove past the houses, we looked around and noticed that even though it was getting dark, there wasn't a single light on anywhere. It was summer and around 9 p.m. and it was eerie. We giggled nervously that maybe everyone there went to bed early. We were heading for a hundred year old rental cabin that was way out on a road which wound through a few farms. It was nearly dark by the time we pulled up next to the little building, even darker because it was surrounded by trees at the base of a granite cliff. We used the combination lock to open the door. We unloaded the car and wanted to start a fire in the wood stove. I used a flashlight to unlock the woodshed, which was stocked full, but when I tried to make some kindling, I found that the axe handle was broken. I moved some wood into the bin on the little front porch. We went across the road to the campground to use the restroom and get ready for bed. It was so dark and the campground was nearly empty with only one site occupied with an RV. Feeling edgy and tired, we went back to the cabin and locked the deadbolt for the night. We were in our sleeping bags on our bunks and we drifted off to sleep. I usually fall asleep quickly, but I also sleep lightly. I woke up to Tammy whispering, there's someone outside. I thought I heard some rustling, and I thought I could hear someone try to open the car door handles. Tammy quietly said that somebody opened the wood bin. We thought that the RV campers were taking our firewood. Then the noises increased. There was rattling all around the cabin. It sounded like a pie plate was being bent. I thought that I may have forgotten to lock the woodshed in the dark, and that somebody was emptying it out. The cabin was set up so that the shutters were padlocked from the outside, so we had no way of seeing out. We were much too scared to open the front door and look to see what was happening. Eventually we fell asleep. When we woke up the next morning, we were anxious to see what the damage was outside. We dressed and went out. In the daylight. It didn't look as frightening as it did the night before, and we were shocked to see that nothing had moved. The woodshed was locked, and the bin was full of firewood and a small can of fuel. There were no footprints, and no other signs that anyone or anything had been there except us. We spent the day exploring the area, and came back to the cabin the next evening. We discussed leaving the shutters open so we could see out. We decided that that wouldn't feel safe and we kept them padlocked. We had a little fire going, and we locked the deadbolt for the second evening. This time I didn't fall asleep so easily. I listened for every little sound, but soon I didn't have to try very hard. The rattling noises were all around us again, and even louder than the night before. We laughed hysterically as we heard little animals scurry back and forth across the roof. It sounded like something was dragging boulders around outside. We talked quietly, trying to keep ourselves from screaming. Then it sounded like somebody was trying to unlock the padlock on the shutter, which was above the windows, nearly seven feet off the ground. There was no way we were going to go outside. We didn't know what was out there. We just laid there and tried to get through it. Eventually, the noises died down, and we got a little sleep. We packed quickly in the morning, and again, found nothing disturbed outside. We will not be going back to that haunted little cabin again.